Okay, here's the representative cast of characters for today's show. Monet's now the painter most associated in the public's mind with Impressionism, I suppose, and his landscapes and water lilies are considered the most representative pictures in the style. Gustav Kai Bott is now best known for his pictures of the apparently not altogether happy urban Parisian middle class. Camille Pizarro is known primarily for his landscapes, but he was also to become the most political fellow in the group. One of the quirkiest of them was Edgar Degas, who was fascinated by ballet dancers and bathers. And Degas was well acquainted with another eccentric, Gustave Moreau, called a symbolist usually, now in any case not an impressionist. And we'll wind up today with Cezanne, now often called a post-impressionist. And we'll also hear quite a bit about writers like J.K. Wiesmann, Mallarmé, and Zola again. And we'll hear music by Offenbach, Debussy, Saint-Saëns, and several other French composers. This is a portrait of Claude Monet by Alexandre Severac, a little-known painter on the fringe of the Impressionist group. Bonham and Butterfields recently auctioned a picture by Severac for just a few thousand dollars. Monet was born into an upper-middle-class family from Le Havre in 1840, and by his teens had a reputation as a quick sketch portrait artist. His mother died when he was young, but his aunt was sympathetic to his interest in art, and although his father was reluctant, he was allowed to go to Paris to study chez Père Suisse when he was 19, and he met Pizarro there. The Brasserie de Martyr was Monet's favorite café in his early years in Paris. It's in a less fashionable area than the Grand Boulevard cafés like Tortoni and Debad, frequented by Manet and his friends. In 1861, Monet was briefly drafted into the army and sent to Algeria, where he said he enjoyed himself, but he caught typhoid fever and was discharged and returned to Paris to study with Charles Glaire, whom I mentioned earlier, and in whose studio he met Renoir, Sicily, and Basile. In 1863, Pizarro introduced him to Cézanne and his friend Zola, just beginning his literary career and already in trouble for writing X-rated stories about prostitutes. Together they all began getting out of town on the newfangled train to places like the Foray de Fontainebleau and Barbizon where Corot and more often Millet had painted in the 1840s. The first picture by him to be accepted by the Salon, however, was of the mouth of the Seine at Honfleur in 1865. It was well treated by the critics who vented most of their spleen that year, as we've seen on Manet's Olympia. It was also this year that he met his future wife, the then 18-year-old Camille Dancieux, and began to run up the debts for which he would be notorious most of his life. This is a portrait of Camille called The Woman in the Green Dress, also successfully submitted to the Salon in 1866. That was the good news. The bad news was that she was pregnant, and for that, Monet's father cut off his allowance. Basile, whom Monet already owed a lot of money, persuaded his wealthy parents to buy this picture by Monet called Women in the Garden in 1867, after it was rejected by the Salon of that year. It's a colossal picture, ten feet high. Still, Monet kept after Basile for more and more money, claiming that Camille and their new baby were starving, although where the money Monet made went is anyone's guess. Courbet was one of Monet's artistic heroes, and although this is certainly not a typical Courbet subject, it irritated jury members because it's on a scale suited to a grand historical or mythological subject, but it's just, well, women in a garden. The jury members also didn't like the visible brush strokes. However, later that year, back in Le Havre, Monet met a fellow named Gaudi Bear who did buy several of his pictures, including this portrait of his wife. In 1869, nothing Monet submitted was accepted at the Salon, but the next year he and Camille, already parents, were married. 
And then the Franco-Prussian War broke out. Manet, Dagon, Basile all joined the army, but Monet fled to London, where he met the Parisian dealer Duran Ruel, seen here in a photo, who was soon to be one of the most ardent supporters of the whole Impressionist group. After the dealer's death, Monet wrote, There's only one person to whom I owe something. It's Duran Ruel, who was described as a crazy man and because of us was almost ruined. The gallery existed until 1974 and is still a research library. Monet was able to sell several pictures in London, and the family moved on to Holland, finally moving to Argentoy, just west of Paris, at the end of 1871, after the suppression of the Commune following the Franco-Prussian War. This is the Argentoy house, 21 Rue Karl Marx now. Monet rented this big house so, according to Renoir, he could live like a lord, and he tried to live like one, with two servants, a gardener, plus laundresses, florists, and caterers as need required. But he ran out of money again, couldn't pay the staff for the rent, and had to move to a smaller place. Monet was visited here at various times by Sisley, Kai Bot, who came on his yacht, and Manet, and it was at this time that Manet painted the picture of him on his boat studio we saw earlier, and this picture of Monet with his family as well. In 1873, Monet painted this picture of poppy fields there, which has always been one of his most popular. Camille and their boy Jean appear both below and above, apparently. The death of Monet's father brought him a small inheritance, and for the first time in a while he may have approached solvency, because he had also been able to sell a lot of pictures through Duran Ruel, and other dealers were interested in his work as well. He reminds me a little of Rembrandt in that he made a lot of money, but was almost always broke. It was later that year, after the Salon had refused to accept any of his paintings and Manet's Le Bon Bach, which pretty much all the Impressionists, as well as Manet himself, considered a sort of joke on the establishment, was the big success, that Monet's friend Nadar offered to rent his studio for what would become the first Impressionist exhibit from April to May 1874. Monet and Pizarro put together a sort of charter stipulating how the Société Anonyme Cooperative des Artistes would operate, and they signed up 13 other painters, including Renoir, Cézanne, Degas, and Morisot. Impression Sunrise, which we saw earlier, is the most famous picture Monet put on display, but this one, Boulevard de Capucine, was also there. We're looking toward the opera house from the upper floor of Nadar's studio in this view with the newly completed Grand Hotel on the left side in the distance. We'll hear more about Monet in a bit, but this is the Grand Hotel as it looks today. In the 1860s, Baron Hosman was commissioned by Napoleon III to oversee a grandiose remodeling of a large part of the city to modernize it, but this project had its critics and still does. The economic and life quality effects of it are hard to all sort out, but although it meant hardship for a good many of the urban poor who were forced out to the eastern industrial and working class suburbs, it's hard to argue that the end result was not beneficial for the city and its people as a whole. Here's a picture of it during the construction. The opera house uh, will be built just to the right. The new Paris opera, or Palais Garnier, was one of the centerpieces of Napoleon III's modernization, which in the second half of the 19th century is usually thought to have become a pretty livable city, at least for the middle class and above, to some extent certainly due to what I guess would be called now the urban renewal projects of Haussmann. Livable can mean different things to different people, though. I read the other day that Wyoming and North Dakota rank 1-2 on a most livable state survey, but I don't think that survey was taken in January. The Opera House is named for the architect Charles Garnier, who won a competition to design it, 
But the story goes that when the Empress Eugenie, wife of Napoleon III, asked him what style it was, he tactfully replied, The style of your husband, madam. While it was under construction, the previous home of the Paris Opera, the Salle Pelletier, famous for its gas lights, was set on fire by them and destroyed. The Palais Garnier opened with both gas and electric lights, but most were electric by 1887. Here's the grand foyer now. The building is a real maze of rooms, corridors, and whole de facto warehouses full of props and other gear. There's even a whole underground stable. In fact, it has several floors of rooms below the level of the stage. It was a suitable setting for the Phantom of the Opera, which turns on the abduction of the Phantom love interest from the stage during a performance of Gounod's Faust, written in 1859, which went on to become the most frequently performed opera in the history of Paris. It was also the opera with which the New York Metropolitan Opera opened. We'll hear the chorus of the soldiers and see some more of Garnier's building. <laughs> finished in 1874, and that was a much more interesting event to most Parisians than the opening of the first Impressionist exhibit that same year. As I said, the reaction of the public to this exhibition of new painting was not unlike the reaction to the Salon de Refusé. Mostly unfamiliar names, unusual subjects, apparently unfinished paintings, most of the conservative critics ignored the ex exhibition altogether, and walked over to look in amazement at something like this, which was thought to be much more worthy of their attention. Castagnari did write a positive review of the Impressionist show, but did say he thought there was no hope for Cezanne, who submitted his modern Olympia, which is a bit hard to figure out. It was obviously painted with Manet's Olympia in mind, 
No one, in fact, liked it, and Cezanne, depressed, went back to Provence. One of the friends of Bert Morisot reported his disgust that modern Olympia was actually touching one of her pictures in the exhibit. The style of it has been compared to Fragonard's, but it's still hard to know how to take it. It's really very like a parody of Manet's work. In the end, no one made any money, and on top of that, Duran Ruel was now also having serious trouble selling any of their pictures. In the spring of 1876, Duran Ruel loaned them his gallery at 11 Rue Le Pelletier near the new opera house and in a fashionable location for a second exhibition. This one was essentially financed by Gustave Caibat and began his association with the group. This is the address on the street, but not the actual building that was there in 1876. This is the Caibat family house at Yer, a suburb southeast of Paris. He was from a very wealthy family and had attended the Académie de Beaux-Arts, but his first picture, now considered a masterpiece, The Floor Strippers, was rejected by the 1875 Salon, by which time he had met Degas and certainly some of the others in the Society of Anonymous Artists, i.e. the Impressionists, and as I said, his money largely financed the second exhibition. In that year, 1876, he also began to buy pictures from his fellow painters, and became one of the main financial supports of Monet. This is Kaibot's Floor Strippers. It was rejected by the Salon probably because it was thought proper only to represent the working class as non-threatening rustics. The urban proletariat had shown itself dangerous, and any representation of it was thought politically suspect. Kaibot was not overtly political, however, and like Manet, Basil, and Degas had been in the army during the Franco-Prussian War. This is probably his most well-known painting, The Rainy Day in Paris. It is often argued that there is a certain atmosphere of alienation in his pictures, of Parisian life. He's sometimes compared to Edward Hopper, whose work is always said to be characterized by that kind of thing. It's like a world of ships passing in the night, little or no communication, each person surrounded by a kind of psychic wall. He was himself peculiar, and of course I've pointed out the eccentricities of his fellow artists before. Their reputations for eccentricity are partly just a result of having their biographies well known. Some of you could probably pass for pretty eccentric too if we knew more about you. Here's the actual location, the Place Dublin, he used as it appears today. This is the picture called the Pont d'Europe. And it may be that Kaibot himself is the man walking this way, at least some members of his family claimed this, but what his connection to the woman might be, or to the man peering down into the Gare Saint-Lazare, or to the dog, is much argued about, and some of the theories are bizarre in the extreme. It is, in any case, like many of his pictures, thought-provoking. There's something about it that suggests that it's more than just a kind of genre subject. Here's the way that bridge looks today. But Kai Bot, although he may have made some sketches here, almost certainly painted the picture in his studio. This is his picture called Sailboats at Argentoy. Like many of the other important Impressionists, he was fond of what was then a fashionable area around Argentoy, where he visited Monet several times, as I mentioned earlier, and quit painting while he was still in his 30s to concentrate on gardening and boating, and then died at just 45. At his death, Renoir became the executor of his estate, which included over 60 paintings by all the important Impressionist artists. They were offered to the Louvre, according to his will, but the Louvre didn't want them. Finally, in 1896, the directors agreed to install some of them in the Luxembourg Palace, the first state-sponsored exhibition of the Impressionists as a group. This is a self-portrait by Kaibot. In 1928, the Louvre told the widow of his brother they wanted the rest of the pictures after all. She said forget it and sold them to Albert Barnes, the Philadelphia drug magnate, an eccentric himself if there ever was one. It was about the time of the second Impressionist exhibit in 1876, the one financed by Kaibot, 
that Monet had met Ernest Hocheday and his wife Alice, who were for some time among his biggest fans, buying dozens of pictures, and in the summer of 1877, after the third Impressionist exhibit, Monet was invited to their estate called Rottenburg, just southeast of Paris. This is a picture of it as it looks today, and at the time, Monet really was living like a lord. Hocheday had inherited a fortune from his businessman father and then married a woman, Alice, from an even more wealthy family, which had owned this chateau. He had no business sense himself, however, and by the time of Monet's visit in the summer of 1877, the Hocheday's were essentially living on his wife's inheritance, which was gigantic but thin it. While Monet was visiting, Horchaday left for Paris, where he was confronted by the bankruptcy of his company and fled to Belgium in debt to the tune of some two million francs with 150 creditors hard after him. The chateau was repossessed with all the furniture and Horchaday's collection of 50 Impressionist pictures by Monet, Manet, and Renoir, and others. This is a picture Monet painted there with turkeys dominating the landscape. Alice was eventually kicked out and gave birth to her sixth child, of whom some think Monet was the father, although he never admitted this, on a train. That Monet began an affair with Alice during this time is, in any case, pretty well taken for granted by most of his biographers. Along with the rebuilding of Paris in Napoleon III's day went a gigantic expansion in French railway construction, so that during his reign, France went from having almost nothing to having 15,000 miles of track, making even the Riviera accessible in hours instead of weeks. By the end of the century, giant railway stations were positioned around the city, and several, Gare du Nord, Saint-Lazare, Gare de l'Est, still serve as many as 300,000 people or more on busy days. One of those, however, now serves a different purpose. This is, of course, the Gare d'Orsay, which houses today more of the pictures we're seeing in this lecture series than any other museum in the world. In early 1877, Monet moved to an apartment near the Gare Saint-Lazare and came up with the idea for one of his most famous pictures. He would paint the interior of the mammoth train station full of smoke and steam. more about this idea, the latter just said he was crazy, but amazingly, he persuaded the station director not only to halt all the trains for half an hour, but to cram the engines with coal and run them to produce even more smoke and steam than normal. He painted several versions, and Durand Ruel bought them all, though he was in an extremely difficult financial position himself. This picture painted there was one of 30 Monet entries in the third Impressionist exhibit in April of 1877. This is a photograph of the Gare Saint-Lazare today. The exhibit also included Kai Bot's Paris in, on a Rainy Day in the Pont d'Europe, as well as Renoir's Ballon Moulin de la Galette and La Balançoire. Kai Bot was once again the primary financial backer of the ex exhibition, as well as one of the exhibitors. We'll hear more about Renoir later, but his pictures were among the least popular with the public, primarily because of their apparent distance from anything grand and traditional and because of the apparently sketchy technique. In late 1877, Monet moved back out of Paris to this house at Vitoy, downriver on the Seine, where, with various loans and gifts, he was able to rent a place in collaboration with the Hochadets. Camille, Monet's wife, now suffering from TB, and Alice Hocheday and all their children, plus apparently a couple of servants and a cook moved in. This is Monet's picture called The Toy in Summer. During his first two years here, he painted nearly 200 pictures, almost all landscapes, and sold enough to keep food on the table. The idea was apparently for Hocheday to become an art dealer and to sell Monet's paintings, and quite a few were sold in one way or another, but never for more than a few hundred francs. However, Monet did send 29 paintings to the Fourth Impressionist exhibit in 1879, which was the most successful yet, and several were sold. This is the one called Vitoy in Winter. 
Camille died in September of 1879, and the whole bunch were barely saved from eviction in the middle of the winter by a loan from Kai Bot. Whatever his feelings for Alice Oshide, Monet was, if we can judge from his letters anyway, deeply depressed by the death of Camille. In 1881, he made more than he had in many years and moved into a new house at Poissy with Alice and their entourage, his two sons and her six children by Hoshide, and the relationship between Monet and Alice became an open scandal and would go on until Ernst Hoshide's death in 1891, after which they would marry. Monet was an atheist, but Alice was a devout Catholic and wouldn't agree to a divorce. This is the picture there he called the Poissy Fisherman. Here we have the linden trees at Poissy, another of only three or four pictures he's known to have painted here in over a year, although he did do pictures of other locations in places like Pourville and Etretat on trips away from Poissy. It's not clear what was wrong, but I can imagine eight kids would make it difficult to work at home sometimes. This picture is said to depict the view from the house, which was large, three stories high, across the garden toward the old town. The picture was sold in 2008 for $1,600,000, but that was less than the expected price. In March 1883, Duran Ruel arranged a one-man show for him, including this picture of the cliffs at Pourville on the Normandy coast, which he had visited while living at Poissy. The show was very well received, although not much money was made from the sales. In any case, the monet Hochede household was able to rent a new place which had appealed to Monet at Giverny, about 50 miles northwest of Paris on the Seine, where he was to spend most of the rest of his life. He made a trip to the Italian Riviera with Renoir in the summer of 1883 and another one by himself the next year and continued to travel and paint in northern France as well. This is a picture he painted at Bordighera on the Riviera in Italy. In 1886, Duran Ruel took a large collection of Impressionist pictures to America and took a big gamble as well, which paid off, and he sold around $20,000 worth, many of them among the 48 pictures by Monet that were on display. Eventually, he opened a gallery on Fifth Avenue. Monet was opposed to the idea of Duran taking his pictures to America, which he regarded as the equivalent to making them invisible. He seems to have thought of a America is another planet, but he wasn't sorry to get the money for them. This is another picture Monet painted on the south coast. It was also in 1886 that the eighth and last Impressionist exhibition was held, and by that time only four of the well-known members of the original group would participate, Degas, Pizarro, Mary Cassatt, and Bert Morisot. This is 251 Rue Saint-Honoré, where the seventh and next to last Impressionist exhibition was held. Monet had opted out after the fourth exhibition in 1879, but he returned for the seventh here in 1882. Georges Seurat's La Grande Jatte, considered the masterpiece of neo-impressionism or pointillism, was in the 1886 show, and Gauguin had been exhibiting with the Impressionists since the fourth show, although his work before he left for Brittany following the last Impressionist exhibit is usually passed over as a preliminary to his true career as a post-Impressionist. He has sometimes been called Gauguin a temporary Impressionist. By this time, in any case, artists like Monet and Pizarro were being regarded as practically old-fashioned, and neo- and post-Impressionism were the new waves. In the summer of 1890, he began a series of over 20 paintings of haystacks in a field near Giverny. He painted them over the next several months, varying the coloring and lighting effects accordingly. The subject isn't so much the haystack as it is the light on it, so it's not really the same thing 20 times at all. You know, Castagnari, on the Impressionist technique, says they don't paint the landscape, they paint the sensation or impression 
produced by the landscape. In 1894, he adopted, adopted the same approach in an even larger series of pictures based on the facade of the Cathedral of Rouen. He moved to Giverny, as I said, about 30, 40 miles from Paris in 1883, and at first rented this house, which he bought in 1890, and which is now probably the most visited artist's house in the world. He went on to build studios for painting and develop the gardens to the point where they are still among the most celebrated in France, even diverting the local river, the Ept, for the benefit of his favorite flowers, the nymphaeas or water lilies. There was some concern among the locals about all this. They were worried about some of the exotic plants he put in poisoning them and about the effects of the water diversion, but in the end all was made satisfactory. He had originally planned to do essentially all the gardening himself, but had to eventually give that up and hire several assistants, seven full-time ones plus more at various times. Martha Stewart, I think, would feel right at home at Giverny. Country chic is what it's all about there. Everyone knows about the water lilies, the thousands of water lilies, the acres of water lilies at the Marmottan Museum and elsewhere, but... What's less well known is how much traveling Monet did after he bought this place. Until he was well into his 70s, he was still traveling around France and beyond. He visited the Riviera, as we've seen, the Cruz Valley, Brittany, London, Madrid, Norway, Venice. Usually this is the point in a lecture where you'd hear the music of Debussy, the quintessential Impressionist composer we've been hearing already, and see a bunch of water lilies, and given that you're awake, probably fall asleep. But instead, we're going to see some paintings he did of the places I just mentioned while we hear the famous aria Pourquoi me Réveiller from Massenet's Werther, like Gounod's Faust, based on, in this case, not a play, but a novel by Goethe, a novel that probably caused more shedding of tears and suicides by emotional lovers than anything written in the whole 19th century. The piece of music was written in 1893, and Monet was living in Giverny at just this time, so I can appeal to that at least. Massenet was probably the most popular opera composer in Paris by the end of the 19th century, though of the 25 operas he wrote, only Werther and Manon are regularly performed today. This is a photo of the garden with the bridge.
This is Monet's grave in the churchyard of Giverny. At his funeral, when Georges Clemenceau saw his coffin covered with a black drape, he took it off, saying he didn't like black. This is an early watercolor by Camille Pizarro, who was born in the Virgin Islands into a French-Jewish family. Although as an adult, he was essentially an atheist and an anarchist besides, while at the same time being regarded as a fine fellow by almost everyone who knew him. His family was able to send him to a boarding school in Paris when he was 11, and after some time back in the Caribbean and Venezuela, he returned to France for good in 1855 at the age of 25, determined to be an artist. This is a self-portrait at the age of 23. After studying with a couple of teachers from the Ecole, he had a picture selected for the Salon on his first try in 1859. It was a landscape that has since disappeared, as have many of his early pictures. He also met Monet and Cezanne at the studio of Père Suisse, where he practiced figure drawing, although for most of his career, landscapes would be his favorite subjects. At the start, he was a great admirer of Corot and the Barbizon painters, but by the time he painted this, the banks of the Marne, which was submitted to the Salon in 1866, he was clearly moving away from the sort of dreamy, misty look associated with Corot's most popular work. This was also his first picture to be commented upon by a critic, none other than Emile Zola, who said, This picture refreshed me for a half hour as I wandered through the great desert of the Salon. This is a picture of chestnut trees at Osney. He painted several pictures somewhat in the manner of Cezanne, still others in a Pantalist or Neo-Impressionist style a la Seurat, but most of his work is closest in style to that of Monet, who was to be a lifelong friend, and Pizarro and Monet are the artists now most associated with the look of Impressionist pictures, and particularly with plain air landscape painting. As I mentioned earlier, Monet and Pizarro were also the main movers behind the first Impressionist exhibition in 1874, and the chestnut trees at Osney here was one of the pictures which Pizarro exhibited on that occasion. In the early 1870s, Pizarro also began to spend much of his time with his wife and family at Pontoise, a suburb of Paris to the northwest, not far from Argentoy, Auvers, and Poissy, which were all popular places with many of the Impressionist painters. For some time, Cezanne was a neighbor, and you can see what is very likely his influence in this picture by Pizarro called the effect of snow at the Hermitage in Pontoise. Cezanne frequently painted his pictures, and he painted the so-called Hermitage here several times on his visit to Pontoise with a liberal use of the palette knife, as Pizarro did here. This is the way the Hermitage looks today. It's called that because a small monastery used to be there, but only houses are there now. Bert Morisot spent the summer of 1863 in one of them. This is the picture called The Woman in the Orchard. Pizarro met Seurat in 1885, and when the latter Sunday afternoon on the Grand Jatte was shown in the final Impressionist exhibit in 1886, it became the talk of the art world, and its plantalism affected Pizarro and many others. The opposition between those who were and were not sympathetic to plantalism was in fact to cause a good deal of acrimony in the artistic community. Gauguin, who as we'll see, was perhaps the most outspoken in his criticism of this style, also irritated Pizarro because of his interest in Christian symbolism and lack of interest in social issues. But it's rare for Pizarro's own work to make any very obvious point about the downtrodden urban or even the rural poor. And some of Pizarro's later pictures, like the Boulevard Montmartre here, glorify the bourgeois worlds of post haussmann Paris as much as anything by Monet or Renoir, who are usually accused of having no social consciousness at all. Pizarro even bought shares in railroad companies when he began to make more money, sometimes thirty, forty thousand dollars a year from sales through Duran Ruel, more than the average income for a doctor or lawyer, or most capitalist at the time.
This is the picture called the Flowering Plum at Aranyi. In 1884, he had begun living in a house in Aranyi, which he would eventually buy and call home until the end of his life, although he would still make frequent trips to Paris. He died in Paris at the age of 73 in 1902, shortly after painting this view of the Louvre in winter. Among those who did not attend his funeral was Edgar Degas, who had split with him essentially over the Dreyfus affair, about which we'll hear more later. This is a self-portrait by Degas, done in 1855 or so when he was in his early 20s. Like many of the other Impressionists, he was from a wealthy family. His father was a banker from Naples, and they spent their summers at the estate of their friends, the Valpensons. There was plenty of money for him to attend the Ecole. About the time this was painted, he left for Italy, where he made hundreds of copies of old masters over a three-year period, expecting to become a more or less uh, traditional history painter. This is the most famous of the pictures he painted in Italy, or perhaps finished in Paris from studies he'd made there which is more likely since it's 10 feet wide and he probably couldn't have gotten it through security. Back in Paris, he painted several mytho-historical subjects while completing this, including one which was accepted as his first Salon picture in 1865, and this was shown in 1867, creating some comment because of the monumental scale, again, given to a family setting that was not Alexander the Great's or Charlemagne's. But the trail for this sort of thing had been blazed by Courbet all the way back in 1851 with his barrel at Ornans and other things, so this was not especially controversial. There seems to be a clear attempt made here to represent the psychic distance which in fact existed between Signora Bellelli, who was Degas' aunt and with whose family he stayed in Naples, and her husband. There is also a clear family resemblance between her and Degas. When the Franco-Prussian War started, he joined up like Manet, Caibot, and Basile, but he couldn't shoot straight since his eyes were already giving him trouble and he was discharged. After the war, he made a trip to New Orleans to visit more relatives, including his uncle and brother René. In this picture of the cotton business they were involved with, Degas' uncle is in the foreground and his brother is behind him reading the sports page or something. And after their father died, the year after this was painted, Degas discovered that René had virtually bankrupted the company. Degas had to sell his house and most of his art collection, but this may have been a blessing in disguise for art because now pretty much forced to paint for a living. He did what most consider his best work over the next 10 years. Many of these pictures are of subjects drawn in a very general way from what might be called discretionary time. The setting is often a cafe or the cafe concert with a stage show or, of course, the ballet. One of the most well-known of these pictures is the absinthe drinker here, set in the Café Nouvelle Etienne, about which we heard earlier. Both this picture and the cotton exchange we just saw were shown along with 22 other pictures by him in the second Impressionist exhibit in 1876, but this picture was the one singled out for the harshest treatment by the critics. There was still a large part of the population that thought art had to have a moral purpose, something uplifting or at least not degrading to be worthy. This is one of the pictures Degas had submitted for the first Impressionist show in 1874. More popular than subjects like the absinthe drinker were the dozens of pictures of theater life, circus performers, ballet dancers, and cafe singers, which sold well enough for him to contribute support to several members of his family caught up in the mess René had made of the family money. Degas exhibited pictures in seven of the eight Impressionist shows, although he was often at odds with other members of the group and didn't like being called an Impressionist. No art was ever less spontaneous than mine, he's supposed to have said. Ironically, Manet, who never exhibited with the group, was often regarded as the leading proponent of artistic rebellion in general, and therefore as at least an honorary Impressionist. 
Monet and Pizarro are probably the two artists, as I said, who actually best represent what we usually think of as Impressionism. Charming landscapes with an emphasis on light and color, atmospheric conditions, quick plain air execution, things like that. But Manet and Degas rarely did any landscapes at all. This is Degas' picture of Miss Lala. It was in the Fourth Impressionist exhibit in 1879. Her troupe performed at various venues in Montmartre and elsewhere. That's Lala, not Gaga, who was hauled to the top of the tent holding a rope by her teeth. Both Zola and Huisman wrote flattering comments about this picture, and they were to be Degas' two most influential writer friends, Zola in the 70s, Huisman in the 80s. How we're to think of these pictures is still much argued about, but it's common to suggest that Corps de Ballet operated on one level as a kind of dating service, and in many of Degas' pictures, men are seen hovering around the backstage areas or coulisses. The dancers he painted certainly don't seem very provocative to us now, but in 1870 to show any part of the leg above the ankle bone was considered at least a bit risque. In any case, Degas was certainly himself fascinated by dancers as a general subject. This is a picture of Les Bouffes Parisiennes. Jacques Offenbach, as he was known in Paris, was the son of a cantor in Cologne, and his father took him to Paris when Jacques was 14 to enroll him in the Conservatoire. He left the next year, however, and became an itinerant cellist, eventually performing with stars like Liszt and Mendelssohn. He married the daughter of the Spanish ambassador and apparently converted to Catholicism to please her and as a career move. In 1856, he rented a building which he turned into a theater called Les Bouffes Parisiennes, which still exists at 4 Rue Monsigny near the Opera House and which is owned at least in part by his family still to this day. This is a photograph of Jacques Offenbach. In 1858, he produced the first of his 100 or so operettas, Orfeo's on Fair, Orpheus in the Underworld. This was followed in 1868 by Gaiety Parisienne, another big success. During the Franco-Prussian War, he was obliged to go back to Germany because some of his operettas were regarded as unpatriotic, and he was even accused of being a secret agent of Bismarck's. He had made fun, ironically, of German militarism in the Grand Duchess of Gerolstein, the memorable General Boom misses war so much when he's not on the battlefield, he fires off his pistols now and then just to sniff the smoke from the barrels. Then he was kicked out of Germany because he was viewed there as a traitor for having gone to France in the first place and wound up in Spain. He returned to Paris after the war but had difficulty drawing audiences and made a profitable tour of the U.S. before returning again to Paris to produce his one opera in the more traditional sense, The Tales of Hoffman. We're going to see some of Degas' dancers now while we hear the Barcarolle, the most famous part of The Tales of Hoffman.
This is Degas' picture called the orchestra. The critics who were sympathetic mostly emphasized the realism in these pictures, especially the theater and cafe concert subjects, but some old school connoisseurs disliked the fragmentation, as it's sometimes called in his work, the way the parts of it are cut off, it's not framed in the traditional way, the legs are at the top, the head's in the middle, torso's at the bottom, and so on. Among the Impressionists, he was old-fashioned in that he never painted outside, and a fortiori never did landscape. The police, he said, should keep a close eye on landscape painters. Degas was, as Woody Allen says of himself, strictly pavement. In the 1880s, Degas painted a series of bathers which were exhibited at the last Impressionist show in 1886. This exhibition sort of marked a changing of the guard with the display of Seurat's neo-Impressionist Grand Jatte and also pictures by Gauguin who had exhibited with the Impressionists before but who is often called, like Van Gogh, a post-Impressionist, and Odillon Redon, one of the most important symbolists. We'll hear more about them later, but this is one of Degas' bathers. The most memorable commentary on this series of pictures is by the standout French eccentric J.K. Wiesmann, an even more extravagant misogynist than Degas. This is a photograph of Wiesmann. His most famous book is Arabur, which means something like backwards, but is usually translated against the grain. It's the story of the anti-social aesthete Des Saint, who withdraws into a specially furnished and bizarrely decorated hothouse to pursue his own intellectual interests. A good part of the book is, in fact, devoted to literary, artistic, and musical criticism. Wiesmann also wrote a book called Certain, specifically as an art critic, and in Certain, he blames what he takes to be the baneful influence of women on France. Woman, he thinks, is an idol that must be toppled, and he thinks that Degas, by painting women in these undignified poses, is showing that he shares that opinion. He's tired of women being flattered by artists with what he calls inane gallantries. He doesn't like ballet dancers either with their mechanical frolics and monotonous leaps. He thinks Degas is treating them with the attentive cruelty and patient hatred they deserve. This is another of Degas' bathers. It's important to emphasize that he likes the pictures. He's not criticizing Degas, whom he thinks sees women and the world in general in the way he does. How much Degas really shared this perspective isn't clear, but he did become a very private person, if not exactly like Huisman's imaginary Des a Saint in later life, and he did in fact say that an artist must live alone, and his private life should remain unknown. The dealer, Durand Ruel, said Degas' only real pleasure was getting mad at somebody. Okay, that's where we'll take the break. <laughs> 